Asian students, this experience, in fact, may be mediated through a non-English language, and the teacher should welcome their deployment of this other language in their writing um, projects. Chiefly, however, as I teach Anglophone creative writing, I encourage students to express and externalize their images and sensations in English phrases and sentences. Even as in the pre-English language ex exercises, for example, I walk them through imaginary stimuli that raise visual images most accessible to them, including colors, shapes, and familiar environments, or through the oral qualities of the world around them, the sound world in which they are immersed, or the physical embodied sensations that they can tap into, such as rhythm and movement. Given the very little time left for sharing all the concrete pedagogical outcomes from these classroom practices with Hong Kong children, let me offer a few instances covering the years between 1999 and 2001 and a semester in 2005. When I first arrived at HKU as chair professor, I asked to teach a two-semester undergraduate course on creative writing. My new colleagues were skeptical, to put it mildly. Besides noting Hong Kong's students' inability to write good English, students' business-oriented careerist goals, and lack of interest in literature generally, my colleagues assured me that very few students I might attract would be registering for the course merely to improve their English grammar. Clearly, they were mistaken and I have prepared a handout of some of the poems that Hong Kong students have composed in my classes. Uh, and I will be citing from some of the essays they wrote at the end of the course, reflecting on their motivations, changing views of poetry, sense of evocation, the transformation of their practice over the semester, and their own creative work. First, students really, really wanted to write poems, and I quote, I love to write poems. I always have that burning desire to express myself. And poetry is the most spontaneous form of writing in my view. I feel very comfortable with the writing process. I still remember how desperate I was to engage in this creative writing course. At first, I was not approved to take it. I knocked at the door of the professor's room. Now, this is Agnes Chen, and it's true, she knocked often. And I let her in finally. This is Akina Lam cheating. I remember my interest in writing formed when I began to write my diary consistently at the age of 14. That year, my mother passed away. Her death was an immense shock to me, and I did not want to forget her. So I picked up my pen and started to write from that day onwards. I see writing as a channel for me to unlock my suppressed emotions, a private space that can hold my thoughts and to say whatever I like." End quote. From Rosanna Lau, Quote, I always love to write. However, before I joined this creative writing workshop, I wrote diaries, essays, compositions, and rhyme poems with cliches. End quote. And from Eva Leung, I cannot remember when it was that I first picked up my pen. I remember my first piece of writing was in my mother tongue, an illogical, silly type of story. I remember I drew an illustration for it. Little did I know that was the beginning of my journey as a writer. When I was 12, my English literature teacher introduced me to poetry writing. I began to write short verses and rhymes, and now I understand how much this experience influenced me. And finally, from Grace Sofon, when I was just a little girl, I had already developed immense interest in language and literature. I always dreamt that I would become a writer someday in the future, but I never really thought that the dream could be put into practice. Moreover, I mainly focused on Chinese writing regarding the English counterpart of Forbidden Garden that I could hardly enter." End quote. As evidence in these self-reflective texts, Hong Kong students, sufficient numbers of them anyhow, show a great deal of intrinsic motivation a desire to write as self-expression and in literary forms like poems. They exhibit a drive and ambition to work on creating literary products that distinguish them from many of their peers. In establishing a creative community in the classroom as an analog to a larger creative sociability, I deployed standard workshop practices, for example, small group dynamics, partner collaborations, collective projects, and always 
and because I'm Asian, I sing, the place of food and eating, so as to rouse and develop strong social bonds. Students take turns bringing snacks to the class, and for my older students, they have to bring wine, volunteering for at least one turn. And the mid-session snack com communion in every class I have taught has been a major factor in increasing student intimacy, lowering individual anxiety, and heightening collective identity. While students free write as autonomous creators, they share these early drafts first with their small group members who offer both praise and suggestions for editing and rewriting. The groups then select a passage from those they'd heard to be workshopped by the entire class. In such collective sharing, students are able to form judgments on the works by their peers, and more importantly, on their own writing, that is to develop a critical consciousness. A student discusses her developing sense of critical judgment in this way, and I quote, by reading poems of others and writing mine, I was given the, op uh, the opportunity to make lots of self-discoveries. From the first portfolio I handed in, my intellectual scope seemed to reveal its limitations. The collection evidently talked about nothing but my relationships. But when I first finished these poems, everything seemed just perfect. Many pieces there, I confess, had the inspiration originated from an elusive affair, and I therefore found them truthful. When I had the printed collection in hand, it seems as if it was dyed freshly from the machine of ecstasy. Having buried episodes brought back to form, I was then exhilarated. The joy of this collection, however, did not last long. After listening to poems my classmates wrote, I gradually wanted to unbury myself from this collection. The past, after all, should not be left in the past. Uh, um, the past, after all, should be left in the past. Apart from blindly scratching old scars and making them bleed, I thought maybe I should give a try on some other topics. Gary's tofu, Gigi's colorful family, and Kerr's two foreign flags at that time opened me up for a whole bunch of possibilities. Their poems seemed to me fresh and inspiring, and it was these poems that drove me to explore issues I seldom touched upon, such as my family life, my country, and my role as a Hong Konger." End quote. Students in their self-discoveries were interested in characterizing their life experiences and accessing their domain of knowledge, including gangster friends, Filipino mates, city scenes, Chinese extended families and cultural rituals, New Year reunion dinners, Qingming visits to cemeteries, Hong Kong political struggles, and so on and so forth. And their poems incorporated stylistic features from Cantonese, particular to Hong Kong English. I know in my abstract, I said I would write something on that, but with 30 minutes, I decided to drop that out. To encourage students to view their work not simply within an ideographic frame, that is, as work by isolated and individual talents, but also as sociometric and histrometric um, work encoded in a communal social work world, I required that their works appear in collective productions. Inviting international poet friends to contribute, I was able to assist the students to publish an international Hong Kong literary journal, Yuan Yang, now in its ninth year of production. About two years ago, the faculty advisor who took over the position from me uh, to bring up Yuan Yang was awarded a grant of one million Hong Kong dollars from the government to support the publication of Yuan Yang over the next five years. In 2004, during my last stint teaching creative writing at Hong Kong University, I found that Yuan Yang had shifted to public publishing mostly international poets and dropping the students' poetry out. So in order to re-establish a collective space for student writing, I mentored a young Hong Kong writer, Tammy Ho, in publishing Hong Kong U Writing. Tammy has gone forward with this project and is now editing an online literary journal called Asian Chow, which allows Hong Kong younger writers a place to submit their creative work for the tree judgment. The shift from framing creative writing pedagogy as the education of individual subjects to establishing social structures where individual talent, communal support, and elite collective judgment coalesce as a social creativity obviously needs more uh, further study on its efficacy. 
In the same spirit of sociometric initiatives in 2000 to 2001, I began offering poetry writing classes to Hong Kong children between the ages of 9 and 14. Ten teacher poets whom I train work with groups of 15 same age group children, identified through the assistance of the Education Department, the Bureau of Manpower, school principals and teachers. These poet teachers offered specific forms of formulas to guide the children in their imaginative play, strategies stolen from Kenneth Cope's Wishes, Lies and Dreams, and from many other texts aimed at teaching the writing of poems to children.